Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Peter Frank and I will be leading our session today. We're going to be looking at the top five most often missed features in Lutheran Service Builder. So this will be a little bit more than an overview. We're going to dig into some key features. We're going to talk very briefly about Lutheran Service Builder, but I want to point out some of the things that are often missed for people who customize their service regularly. And uh, I think that's most of you, especially if you're here today. So this is going beyond the basics into some of the more advanced tools within Lutheran Service Builder. Again, my name is Peter Frank. I am the Senior Manager of Marketing Technology here at Concordia Publishing House. I've been working with our Lutheran Service Builder team for about two and a half years, which means for the entire life of the online version. Um, I have quite a bit of experience with the previous version, but I would guess many of you have even more than me. Um, Lutheran Service Builder has been out since 2006. Lutheran Service Builder 2 was released in 2008. And 10 years later, this year in 2018, we launched the online version. So there's a lot of longtime users out there, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm happy to share some of my insight that um, I have gained by working with our team and working with customers to find some of the most useful but often missed features of Church 360, or pardon me, of Lutheran Service Builder. I often present on Church 360. So if I slip into using that phrase, I apologize. My contact is on the screen. Uh, you can reach me by my email address or my phone number. Phone number um, will go directly to my office, and I like to check it, make sure I have my calls forwarding to voicemail. So please don't try calling me right now. I will not answer. Um, I wish I didn't have to say that, but I have received calls during webinars before, so I always make sure to mute my phone. All right, a few housekeeping items before we begin. I've planned about 50 minutes for this presentation. Um, I tend to go over that amount. There's always more than enough information to cover. So I apologize in advance if I go over that amount. Um, those last 10 minutes really are meant to be dedicated for question and answers. Now, if I don't have enough questions, there's no harm in going over those 50 minutes um, because it's just more information I can share. But if you have questions, um, I do want to answer them, especially during that time. So please go ahead and ask questions throughout. You can see that um, there is a question box on your GoToWebinar screen. Um, I'd love to kind of test that muscle out right now just to make sure you know where it's at. So for those of you who um, are here, can you let me know where are you watching this from? I know you all registered and put that information in. Um, we often get a large number who register and about half of them show up. So if you can put in the chat where you're watching us from today, you can put your name, uh, your name does show up. You can just take what church and city and state, something like that will help me get a good idea of where you're coming from. I'll have a few other questions for you in a few minutes, but that'll help me see that you know where to put your questions. We are recording this webinar. In fact, I hit that start record button right before I began. And we do that because we know many people can't attend live, but still would like to watch this after the fact. And so it helps um, kind of work with your schedule. For those of you who are attending live, it also gives you the chance to review this information later or share it with somebody else at your church. So later on today, I'll send you a link to the recording. We'll be adding this to our resource center. Um, so that's where the link will go. And there's uh, links to other recorded webinars as well. So feel free to watch this again or share this with others. Um, the goal is to get this information out. So um, be on the lookout for that. Looks like we've got a number of people who are filling out the questions. We've got Daniel from Grayson, Clarksville, Tennessee, Kurt from Amherst, Colorado, Steve from Zion in um, Piedmont, I believe that's how I pronounce it, um, California, Joyce from Holy Cross in O'Fallon, not too far from here, and then uh, Jeannie is asking, is your mic on? Um, it looks like everybody else can hear me, so you might want to turn on your volume. Yes, I'll put that in here. Must be your volume. All right, so I'll put that in there for Jenny. Hopefully she can get on as well, because I'm guessing everybody else has heard me if you're answering those questions. All right, well, let's continue. I always make some assumptions about who's attending um, the webinars today. It helps me get a, a good idea of kind of um, how to frame the material. So if these assumptions are not correct for you, I apologize, but we'll have a, a few questions or you can share that with me in the chat too if it's not. But I'm assuming that you have experience with preparing services. That doesn't necessarily mean um, that you have prepared services from scratch, you know, written them from yourself, but at least prepared them for worship. 
Uh, I'm guessing you're not new to this. That's my hope. I'm also expecting you to be comfortable with the online Lutheran Service Builder. If this is your first experience looking at Lutheran Service Builder, um, then some of this might be over your head. Uh, you don't have to be a pro at it. In fact, you don't even have to be um, actively using the online subscription. But um, I am kind of expecting you to have that active subscription so that you can get started using that today. Now, if you don't have that, that's okay. You can start a free trial. We'll have information on that later on too, but you can go to lutheranservicebuilder.com and start your free trial and still take advantage of these things. But um, the way I prepared the information today was expecting these things, assuming that um, I can jump ahead to the more difficult stuff. So that's, what, um, that's how I prepared that. But let me ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself just to kind of validate some assumptions that I might have. So I've got a few poll questions. The first one is about your primary role at church. So I'm going to launch this survey. If you could select the option that most closely describes your primary role, knowing that you might have different roles. Everybody wear, seems to wear a lot of hats in the church. Um, but it'll just help give me an idea of who is here today. All right. It looks like we've got almost half of you are ordained pastors. About a third are in the administrative role. Oh, that's changing some more. We've got down to about a quarter in the administrator role, a little less than half as pastors. Then we've got uh, um, some called church workers and others. No church musicians today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Um, and in fact, I can share those results with you as well. There you go. So you can see 38% are ordained pastors, 25% are in the administrator role. 13 is a called church worker, and 25% are others. I would be curious as to who the others are. So if you want to drop that in the chat, that would be helpful to me. All right, we'll go ahead and hide that. And then are you currently using Lutheran Service Builder in your congregation? And this could be the online version or Lutheran Service Builder 2, um, even Lutheran Service Builder 1. I know we still have a handful of churches that prefer that version. Um, but I'm expecting you to have some experience with this. And it looks like we are at just about, um, yeah, we're not quite at 100% voted, but so far 100% have said yes. So very good. I'll go ahead and close that because that is definitely the overwhelming majority or actually the entirety. So very good. That's kind of what I was expecting. And then the last one here is what would you consider your Lutheran service builder skill level to be? Expert, advanced, intermediate, novice, or newbie? So intermediate and above is kind of what I was expecting, but please be honest, it's okay if you are in one of those lower two, um, but it looks like, yeah, we've got so far everybody at intermediate or above. Very good. So that allows me to kind of just jump right into some of the more difficult or hidden features of Lutheran Service Builder. All right, that's all for the questions for you. Let's talk through our outline. So the first of the five is advanced search queries. And this one is, we've tried to make it as easy to find as possible. So I don't wanna say that it's all gonna be things that are missed, but based on what we can see um, from statistics and, and current usage stats, there's some things that aren't being used as frequently as others. So we're gonna go through some of the different ways to use search. So advanced search queries is number one. Next is bulletin formats, and this is based on a lot of the feedback that we get, questions that come into our support team that says, well, how do I get my bulletin or my presentation to be like X? And we often have those answers ready to go because the software provides it. And so we always look at these questions and say, okay, they, we offer this, um, but it's not being found. So we're gonna get into some details on that. Um, and if there's things that you wanna do still that we can't do in bulletin formats, that's gonna help us know where to go with development. So we wanna clear out some of these already answered questions first so we can get into some of the more detailed ones because we know that as you do custom bulletin formats, there's always gonna be things that we haven't thought about yet. That's what we're trying to uncover. And I wanna make sure we answer all those questions that we have already answered. All right, next is my worship resources. And we could spend probably a whole day talking about all the different uses for this and getting into some very minute details. We're not gonna get into that level of detail, but I do wanna show a few key things and talk through some potential uses for my worship resources that might be missed. 
Next, we're going to get into Let Us Pray files, and this is an area that you might not be using, you might not have ever heard about before, but it's really easy to use, and we're actually going to be making it easier in the coming weeks. But we'll start off with how it is right now. So Let Us Pray files um, are the ability to import the prayer of the church based on what the LCMS Worship Office has provided. So I continually have people who say, oh, I didn't know about that, and I shared it in most of my webinars. So I wanted to bring that in here too, because we still continue here. Well, I didn't know about that. So I want to make sure you know about it. And lastly, custom liturgies. And this one I really feel is kind of hidden. And I don't think it necessarily needs to be brought forward more, um, but I, because it's meant to be part of the workflow, but I'll show you how that works. Um, custom liturgies is kind of a tough name to call it because it makes it sound like you're building your own liturgy, which is not actually what you're doing. You're customizing an existing liturgy, um, but it can be kind of difficult to get to there. It's not difficult to use at all, so we'll show you how that is. So those are the five things that we're going over today. Um, I think we should get started. So let me switch my screen over to Lutheran Service Builder. Now, this is part of my browser. There's a, a cool feature in Google Chrome where you can save a web page essentially to your desktop, add it as a shortcut. What that does is it removes all the browser functionality like the, um, the address bar or bookmarks or anything. It gives you just more of a big space to work with. So while this might look like I'm in a separate application, I'm actually in my browser. And I am going to zoom in a little bit um, you can do that as well. We have built Lutheran Service Builder to be what we call fully responsive, which means regardless of what size your screen is, how far you zoom in, it still works. Now, there's some screens that are better to be zoomed farther back just because of the amount of information, but whatever your comfort level is. And I like to zoom in for webinars because I know you're watching on a tiny little box on your computer. So we'll go ahead and just plan for this next Sunday because we're not going to do a whole lot of service planning, but I want to start here to show you the search and how it's used typically and then how we can go into more advanced. So I'm sure you're familiar with seeing this proper screen. The next step is to go ahead and plan the service. So we'll click that button up there. And this is where you start planning at a high level. And this is really the first place that you encounter search. So you'll see readings and hymns, and then order of service and additional rights. So we'll go here first to readings to go to add a reading. And the goal of this first section is to show different uses of search. So you'll see here that your suggested readings, which are based on the lectionary, and that is set up in the settings. Uh, I believe I should be using the three-year. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. Um, you'll see these readings are already in place. Now, you can look for suggestions for these different days, so like suggestions for Pentecost 24 or 26. These are the weeks preceding or, or after, uh, and you can see what those are. Now, what's nice about this, and this is something we've recently rolled out to make it a little bit more visible, it's always kind of worked this way, is this name of the service, so Pentecost 25. Um, and so you can, if you wanted to do this at any time, you could say Pentecost 25. So there's the readings um, for today. So the three-year lectionary, you have um, a, B, and C, it shows those listed out. But let's go ahead and go back here a second. What I want to show you is even more basic. We'll just reset the search. You can type in really any kind of scripture reference, and you'll see we provide these helps here. So we'll just go with Raised with Christ. You can see that if I put Raised with Christ, it's going to show some scripture where that phrase is used, not necessarily in that exact order. You can put it in quotes to say the exact phrase, and it limits it to just where it says Raised with Christ. Now, um, I should clarify, this is only available in the ESV translation. We get a lot of requests for NIV based on synod requirements of ESV being the preferred um, translation and based on copyrights and how we've gone about building it, we've only put ESV in here. So just I often get that question. I like to answer it before it's asked. But what you can also do is you can type in any kind of scripture reference. So if you wanted to type in John 3, it would show you any of the readings 
within John chapter 3. And in the same way, if we want to just add 316 because that's so common, um, you can see that John 316 shows any of the readings where it's in there. Now, you don't have to just use the ones where it's reading set for a day in the church. Here. You can actually just use that verse. And really, when you type that in, that's what's showing. So maybe you want to use John 3, 16 through 20. And that's not the set reading. You probably are cutting off 21. But that's okay if that's what you want to do. You can assign that reading for today. But you can also go and click this button up in the top right corner, the show high preview, and see that exact reading. So if you are using some kind of, I don't want to say obscure, but a reading different from the lectionary that is not used in that combination from any lectionary, that's really easy to do. You just type in that reference and put it in, and then you can use it. So sometimes that's easily missed that you can do those kind of custom readings. All right, let's go down to hymns next. So when you add a hymn, you get a number of different suggestions. And this is why I think sometimes the sort of search muscles that we have aren't stretched or are strengthened because we try to make it so easy to pick hymns that you might use without you having to search for them. And that's what we've done here. You have the hymn of the day, hymns for the readings, other suggested hymns based on the themes. So we give you a long list of options. But again, maybe you have a different type of hymn that you're wanting that doesn't fit with any of these suggestions. Well, the first thing that is easy to miss is that if you type in um, pound or hashtag hymns and hit enter, it's going to give you what used to be the browse. Um, there we go. So all of the hymns in Lutheran Service Book will then be listed. And in fact, it's slightly more than in Lutheran Service Book. There's 20 additional hymns that are considered Lutheran Service Book that are not in the printed version. And so you'll see those as you go throughout. So some of them, um, let's see if I can find an example of that. Yeah, like right here, Society. Um, Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love, 980. You won't find that in the printed hymnal. That's one of those 20s that we added on kind of after the fact. I like to consider it like the bonus features on a movie or something. So you can see all the hymns here. But when you have this filtered by hymns, now you can add something else. So we could put in like thy strong word. And it's going to show any hymns related to that phrase and just hymns. It's not going to show anything else in there. Um, then you can do that kind of combination as well, where you say the exact phrase. And there's our thy strong work. Now, I'm going to go to the preview next because that gives you some additional ways of doing some advanced searching within things like hymns. So this is the preview. There's the melody of that hymn. But then under info, you get a wealth of additional information. So you have the authors of both the text and the tune, the copyrights um, for text and tune, the melody, the meter, the key. Now, I'll clarify, I'm not a music person, so I know that what those words say. I don't necessarily know what they all mean. But um, the key thing here is that anything that is in blue, and you, next you have like related topics or related scripture, um, or where it's tied in with the, uh, the readings of the lectionary. You can see all of these are listed as blue searchable links. So let's say you wanted to find something that had that exact same meter. You can search for meter 8787D, and maybe then you want to add a um, topic of, I don't know, Advent. That's, I probably should have tested these out, or maybe I should have spelled it right. <laughs> there you go. So now we have a t an Advent hymn with that same exact meter is Thy Strong Word. And you can see that right here. The tune name is different. The tune name here is Jefferson, but that meter works in the same way. Now maybe you want to switch it and search for the tune name. So Jefferson is the name of the tune. It's the same for Come Thou Long Expected Jesus and Who Are You Who Walk in Sorrow. And so you can see that these essentially sound the same thing. They're even in the same key. It's just different text.
So if you're trying to find something that is similar, this is really a hymnal search engine to the greatest extent that it could be. So um, if we want to look at, you know, text by Charles Wesley, you can search by that. And then you can add in another one where you say, okay, now give me the topic of, um, let's do Lent. Did he have any Lent? No, he didn't. So we could just go here and see, I should have just looked at those. He didn't have Lent, but he did have Easter. You know, Jesus Christ is risen today, that great Easter hymn. You can look through these different um, options and combine these search queries together. Now, I'm going to close here and show you one last thing related to search before we move on. Up in the top right corner, there is a search button. That magnifying glass, I'm sure everybody recognizes that as search. What this does is this provides you with the search but in the full screen and quickly see all the previews. So like if I want to look at a mighty fortress, that preview is in here. It's just like I had it slid in across the screen, but it's not adding anything to my service plan, but it does allow you to export this from here. Now, um, if you are used to planning out your service and, and building out your bulletin within Lutheran Service Builder, you might have less use of this. But we actually have churches that will do this exclusively. They're building their entire service in a separate uh, application like Microsoft Word or Adobe InDesign. And they're just using this search for finding the different aspects of their service, whether it's hymns or other parts of the liturgy, and exporting that out. So like down here, here is a world we'll use Mighty Fortresses or God. You can say, okay, I'm only going to use stanzas one, three, and four. And I want to go ahead and just export it out. And I can export it to a document, docx file, which is Microsoft Word. Let me make sure this comes up on the view. Oh, it's coming on my other screen over here. Hang on one second. I'll pull it over as soon as it's done. So it will export directly into Word. And now this has been counted as a usage for copyright purposes. So just like exporting the bulletin, it does all of the reporting for you. And so if you're using Lutheran Service Builder for your weekly bulletins and you're exporting it out, like um, using those primary tools, you might use something like this for special occasions, or maybe you're wanting to use the hymn as a starting point for a devotion before a meeting, or you're doing a hymn study. We're going to be doing that at our church in a few weeks, where our music director will be leading a Bible study on certain hymns. You can export these hymns out and use them in different ways, fully um, tracking all the copyrights appropriately. So it's just kind of a hidden feature in that search seems so much like searching for service planning, but it works just like a hymnal search engine that you can export and use the information fully complying with copyrights. All right, I could talk about search more, but those are some of the key things that I wanted to point to. Let's now move into um, the next thing, which is best practices for bulletin formats. And so I'll go back to our outline for a second. Um, oops, I went to the wrong thing, just so that you've got an idea of where we're at and so I can kind of stay on task. Bulletin formats is next, and yeah, we're doing all right on time. So let me go back into Lutheran Service Builder, I'll close out a search, and I'll go up here into settings, and then bulletin formats. So we've done a number of different trainings on bulletin formats where I go into quite a bit of detail. Um, I want to look at this from kind of a high level and a granular level. The first off the high level, bulletin formats um, are typically thought of as this is my bulletin format that we use on a weekly basis. I want to stretch that thinking a little bit to say that your service is what you use on a weekly basis and your bulletin format is just the various ways you export that same service out. So let me explain what I mean. You might have your default bulletin format. Actually, this isn't even the out of the box. Here we go, old default, out of the box. This is what it looks like as a default. And you might say, all right, by default, the bulletin that we print for everybody is going to be eight and a half by 11, landscape folded. Um, that's what gets printed out. That's what goes into the bulletin cover shells. This is our bulletin. 
but you might also have a large print bulletin that you print you know, 10% as many as your regular bulletin. It's the same service, it's just a different format. That's probably a pretty common example. But what you might also have is something that prints the pastor's version of the bulletin. So let me give you an example. Let's say we're gonna start with this kind of out of the box default. I'm gonna copy this and say this is the pastor's version. So first off, what would be different about the pastor's version? Well, in the out of the box default, we may not want all the rubrics to show. Um, it may not be necessary if they're following along. You might have the rubric shown in a different way. Or maybe on the pastor's version, you don't need the headings to show because the pastor knows when confession and absolution is versus service of the word versus service of sacrament. But in the default for the people in the pews, you want to use that as a teaching tool. So those are just a few kind of simple examples of this content. Um, but let's dig in a little bit more on terms of pastor's preferences. So pastor's version, you, we said might not have the headings, but we'll show the rubrics so that he knows what's going on. We might want to say, well, pastor needs kind of a large print bulletin. He's going to be reading from this. Uh, we want to make it as easy as possible. So maybe we have everything at a size 14 font. So the body is a 14 font, the headings, maybe we do a 14 font, but it's bold. The, oh, actually we turn off headings. The captions would be a size 14 font as well. Um, maybe pastors isn't going to be folded. Maybe it's gonna be in a binder. So we will take off the folding for that and change it to portrait. So now it gives us a better view of that. Um, let's see what else. Maybe pastor has a particular font that he likes that doesn't necessarily match what um, the rest of the congregation is using. So maybe pastor likes Arial. And so we'll put that as the caption. And for the body, we'll also do that as Arial. And then maybe there's no need for the indentation here. He's not so much concerned about styling. He just needs a little bit of spacing to be used. So we'll go to, into the caption. We'll add some spacing after that. That might be too much on the body. Let's drop that down. There we go. Maybe the rubrics are necessary to really call out for pastor. And so we'll go in here and say, all right, those are also going to be aerial. And we want them to be size 14 like anything else, but because they're italic and we'll make them red, he knows that those are rubrics. And we can always add a little bit of spacing before and after them too. So you can start to customize this in the way that pastor needs rather than what the congregation needs. So I'll go ahead and save that as the pastor's version there. And you'll see then as you go into the out of the box default, it starts to look a little bit different. Here's another example. Maybe the bulletin, you print the, um, let's go in here, for the hymns, you print the melody. Whereas for pastor's version, he just wants the text. Maybe he's like me and can't sing to music anyway, so there's no need to have the melody there. He just needs the text. Those are some different options that you can um, customize for your bulletin formats in a way that may not be used by anybody but one person. You know, you might want to have a different format that hides everything except for the hymns. And that is, uh, you just provide that checklist for the organist to play. There's a variety of different options, but I want to kind of push that thinking about bulletin formats to be just about how it looks and to really get into that mindset of how it's used. All right, so now on the more granular level, we've already talked about that some um, just by looking at styles. But there's some different things that you can do to kind of make it look a little bit better. So um, we'll go to the old default, the out of the box, and we'll look at something like headings. So you can go here to headings and they can kind of look like captions if they are not um, distinguished through different styles, but maybe you don't want it to be a size 20 font. We could just change this down to a size 14 and then we can style it through like centering 
And then one thing I like to do is add the little plus before and after. It kind of looks like a Roman cross. It really calls out that this is a different part of the service. In fact, we can even make it bold to stand out even more. You have this text before and after that you can put that in. Now, maybe the, um, the cross is not anything that you want to include in there because it's really a plus sign you could do something different or you do what my grandpa used to call the little whizzy wig and say i think actually called the tilde no that's not the tilde the tilde is that one i don't know i don't get into all of that too much but it's uh, stylistic choices is really what it comes down to and these are based on our customer feedback saying you know the way i like to set this part of the service um, a part to identify it as something different is through little symbols like this. So I personally like the plus sign there for it. And you can even do something like italics there to set up, or you can do all caps. I don't know, there's a number of different ways you can utilize that. So as we go through here, you also have things um, like rubrics, which lend itself to a different style, um, lend itself to a different color like the red. I mean, that's in the name. But you could even look at something like captions and say, I want to put more information in the caption, but I don't want to overwhelm people with it uh, in there as it's printed. So we can go here to the captions and say, always show the liturgy caption and always show the role and the name. So like here, Holy Gospel for uh, is from Matthew, as opposed to just putting Holy Gospel or Matthew. You really wanna use this as a teaching tool, but it starts to clutter up the screen. You could do something where you give it a little bit more spacing just to break it out. And then maybe you drop down the font size quite a bit and you make it you know, a little bit lighter gray. And then, um, yeah, what I like to do too with some of these is put the reference. And we'll talk about captions. Actually, I think I can pull that up, or subcaptions in just a moment. So subcaptions are the part on the far right here. You could put in scripture reference and anywhere there's a scripture reference tied in with the liturgy, it'll show that. So um, yeah, subcaptions, we can put in that same kind of style where it's a light gray, it's a little bit smaller, and we'll go, um, I think it was the trebuchet. Yeah, that's probably a little bit too light gray. You can't even see it. But if you wanna kind of subtly put in these teaching tools to teach about the liturgy, you can do that without it overwhelming your bulletin. So there's so many different formatting options. It's not just about how you use it for appearance sake, but how you use it as part of the worship. It can help teach, it can help explain why the liturgy is in there in that same way, even though people aren't speaking that. So I'll get off my soapbox now. I get excited about that kind of stuff. Bulletin formats are so powerful and there's so much that you can do in here that it's easy to miss it. So I'll, we do have other training webinars that go through this in greater detail, but I really wanted to just draw your attention to all of the different tools and usages just within the screen that I think are often missed. All right, let's take a step back and I'll save this just so that if we come back to that, I wanna get into my worship resources next. So I'll close out a bulletin format. It's gonna take me back to my service planning view. Um, I'll close out of the search too. Up under settings, you have my worship resources. And we're gonna just go right over to my common elements to start. My worship resources are aspects of the service that you would like to include on a regular basis, uh, on a repeatable basis, maybe is a better way of saying that, that are not found in Lutheran Service Book. And there's a lot of different ways we can do this. One common example might be um, your communion statement. So I'll show you how to do that here. So under my common elements, and you can go to any one of these, you've got prayers, hymns, liturgies, and talk about that in a little bit. Copywriters, psalms, tones, uh, templates, and tunes. Those are all the different ones. Common elements is kind of the catch-all. And so I like to start there because we can go really basic. We could start by just saying add a common element, and we'll call this communion statement. And I've already got this pulled off screen here. Let me copy and paste this in. 
there is the recommended communion statement for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And um, you can say, all right, so the name of the comment element, how it shows in my worship resources is communion statement. And the caption, it says new comment element, we'll put that as communion statement or our, you know, our communion statement or what we believe about communion, something like that. About communion. However you want to put it, however you want it to show up in your bulletin. And you can say, well, you can hide the caption by default. I don't really want to hide it. I want to show it. And you can say overall, override default subcaption with um, something like, I don't know what you would say. Probably actually in this case, you wouldn't have it. But if you wanted something to show up as the subcaption always, you could put that in there. So maybe you want to put something like this scripture reference here. And you could put all of those in there. That's quite a bit for a subcaption. Maybe then we would just say communion statement. That still might be quite a bit too or too much for a subcaption, but we'll go with it for right now. And then you can delete that in there. So um, you can add a number of different things on here. So like if you wanted to label it as used for a different part of the service, it doesn't really work with um, communion statement, but you have all of these different options. So it could be a common element that could also be used for absolution or the benediction, that kind of thing. This is meant to be very flexible. You can put topics or the scripture, you know, we could put in those different scripture references in here too, if we wanted to. And then it could come up in when we search for those specific scripture references. So you want to put one on each line and clarify it a little bit. And we'll take off these uh, semicolons just so that it shows up a little bit cleaner. Corinthians. You could also remove it during different times. Obviously, for a communion statement, that doesn't make sense. Um, and then you can also change the name here if you wanted to, to say communion statement. This is more related to things like um, hymns, which we'll look at in just a moment, if you want to say, well, this is text versus melody. But sometimes it's nice to just clarify this is the communion statement. All right, so I'll go ahead and save that. Let's go take a look at how it's added into the service. So we'll go to prepare the bulletin and I'll choose my divine order of service setting one or divine setting, divine service setting one. We can put it into our old default, our out of the box template. And let's go down all the way to service of the sacrament. So I can say insert element and then I'll drop it in right here after service of the sacrament. And now I can search for communion statement. And there it is. So yeah, that subcaption is a little bit too much. Um, we may not need to put that all in there. So if you uh, saw what I put in there, let's do hashtag reference. There is all of what's in there under the subcaption. Um, one thing I forgot, I started to go into and then I got distracted was the different subcaption options that we have. Um, the different subcaption options would be like page number, hashtag PG hashtag, if it's referencing a page number in Lutheran service book. Package, so for the name of the selected content. Um, this is probably not as commonly used, um, but if it's trying to clarify where or how it's being grouped together. You have stanzas, so if you want to show the stanzas of a hymn, if they're not the, all stanzas. So if you put that, it shows nothing if you're saying all of them, but if you're doing like a one, three, and four, like we looked at before, it would identify that. And then the reference, which we've talked about already, the scripture references, which we plugged in there. So that's why all of these different scripture references are showing. And it's probably a bit too much. We maybe should have abbreviated those. But I think the key thing here is to show that this communion statement can be used over and over again. You don't have to add that into Word. Um, you don't have to think about that after the fact.
So that's how common elements can be used. Let's go back to my worship resources and show one other thing. Often we'll hear, well, we use hymns or Christian songs that are not in the hymnal. How do I use those in Lutheran Service Builder? Well, we have that under my worship resources, my hymns. Now, by calling it my hymns, we understand that it might confuse you by thinking these are hymns that you wrote. That's not the case. These can be any hymns or songs that you want to include in Lutheran Service Builder. And this can this is definitely on the advanced side of our tools. But let's go ahead and pull open um, an example. So let me, I should have had that on the screen before. So as stone on living stone is set is something that one of our editors wrote um, for an anniversary of a local church here. And so we have all of the text already separated in a Word document, and that's going to be one of the key things. Um, and if you're only doing text, that's all you need. But we also have the actual hymn that is engraved in its entirety as what's called a TIFF file, T-I-F, that is a type of image file. And so that works best because it's the highest quality. So you can see as I zoom in, it's still high quality. So a stone on living stone is set. I'm going to go ahead and go back into Builder, and we're going to create, looks like we've already got a hymn there. I'm going to remove that hymn and say add hymn as stone on living stone is set. And how am I doing on my uh, time here? Yeah, I'm on the third one. Let me jump back there just so you can see where we're going because the last two are tied in with this. Good. All right. So we have here, let's go to my Word document. We have one, two, three, four, five stanzas. So I'm going to add five stanzas here. And I'm going to go back in and I'll copy the first stanza text and paste that in there. Second stanza, paste that in there. Third stanza. I'm sorry to make you watch me copy and paste, but I do this to show just how simple this can be. All right, there are my five stanzas. That's typically what you'll have, and that's easy to find even if you're doing a common Christian song. Um, they typically publish the text available for you. So on the far right, we've already got the name of the hymn in there from when we set it up before. We could add labels to it if we wanted to, if it could be used as a different part of the service. We could add topics or scripture. Um, for example, do we have scripture on here? Um, no, it doesn't look like we've identified that, so I won't go with that right now. Um, but the text, we could add the author, and this is Lisa M. Clark, and that's all stanzas. And then, yeah, we've got the different, we could name the stanzas. So maybe if you had something that you wanted as, um, I have to say Spanish one, if part of the stanzas were in Spanish, that's just what shows up on the number of stanzas. And then where you could have the different scripture, you could put that as a refrain or, refrain or a doxological stanza. Doesn't look like we have that here. So that's probably good for right now. We'll go ahead and save that. Um, and then we'll go into the melody. So the melody is added as an option, and in this case, we have it. So I'll go ahead and say, all right, replace the engraving, which right now is nothing. Let's upload a file. And, oops, different folder. We will upload this TIFF file, and it will display it in here. And you can say what you want that full width to be. What's the DPI and the sh threshold? It'll explain that in more detail. Um, typically, I go with what is by default, or sometimes I say, well, I'm never going to have it be a, um, you know, 11 inches wide. Maybe I will have it be eight and a half, and you can do it that way. Um, that doesn't matter as much. It's all about how you bring in the quality and splice the hem out. So we'll just put it at that, and we'll click Next. And it says adjust the edges around the music so that there is as little space as possible. What you really want to do is get just down to the music itself. No header information, no copy information, uh, music and stanzas, of course. And so we crop it down to that level and we click Next. 
And now what it's going to do is say, well, we've separated all of the music from the different stanzas. And all of that is in good shape. Good. All right, we'll go to next. And if you look at it, you kind of test it and say, okay, it's identified stanza one, stanza two, stanza three, four, five. All of that is great. So we'll leave that in there as is, and we'll hit finish. So it's going to save that. And that one went very smoothly because the music was all engraved properly. And that's a key thing, is that if you have a good image to use, the process of use, creating a new hymn in My Worship Resources goes very smoothly because so much of what is done is being automated. So under the melody, a couple things we want to do is say, all right, who is the author? Well, we know it's Kevin Hildebrand, one of our composers here at Concordia Publishing House. So we'll say Kevin Hildebrand. We'll save that. And then copyrights. Well, where's the copyright? Down here in the bottom, copyright Concordia Publishing House. So we'll add copyright Concordia Publishing House. I think that was 2017, yep. And we can go and look, and this is where under my um, copyright holders, you can add additional copyright holders. But if it's already one that's in there, like Concordia Publishing House, we can save that in there. All right, so now we'll save that hymn. I'll exit out of here. That should take me right back to my service. And let's say I want to do this. Um, <laughs> Where is there a hymn? We'll just go ahead and add a hymn. Oh, here, hymn of invocation, right at the top. So then I can say, as stone, and we'll just look for that. As stone on living stone is set. It shows up under hymns, but there's no hymn number because it's a custom hymn. Now, if I wanted to add a hymn number to search for it, I could, I just would want to make sure it doesn't conflict with existing numbers. But all I have to do is click on that, and it puts it in there, and it is a little bit wide. Um, one of the things we can do with bulletin formats, which I should have done before, is, and we'll go to edit bulletin formats real quick and show you under content, um, oops, under layout, you can automatically scale the music. So we'll save that, and that'll scale it to the width. So let's go back to my bulletin now. And as we click on that text, I'm not sure why it's not scaling. I must have done something wrong there. But what I want to show is that you can, yeah, I'm really surprised that's not working. I'll have to figure out why that's not. It might be a refresh issue. I'll try that real quick. What I want to show is that it functions like any other hymn in Lutheran Service Builder. Yeah, it's still not scaling right. I must have done something wrong there. But you can even remove certain stanzas. So if you want to do one, three, and five, you have that all there. You can switch it to the um, to the text only, which in this case might be better because it's not scaling properly. And then what also happens is when you go and export it, it's going to... Um, well, in this case, because I put in the Concordia Publishing House copyrights, it shows that. Um, if I well, actually no, if I go back to, we didn't add a copyright for the text. That's what I forgot to do. But if I go to Melody and I go to export it, it should ask me. For, yeah, here we go. Do I have permission to use that? And you can say yes. I do have permission and I can add in that license name and number there just to confirm that. And it'll print it out in the bulletin too. All right, so um, Steve is asking, does the Melody file have to be a TIFF? I believe you can upload it as any file format, but TIFF typically works the best. So we always recommend that. So that's a good question. Um, I can confirm later on that it is indeed TIFF. Um, in fact, I can show you how we can, you can search for those things. If we go into, um, we can do it from any screen. Let's see, import him. Down in the lower right corner, there's an information section. And we can say import him. Do we have an article on that? 
we may not have that. My hymns, my worship resources overview. This will give you access directly to our help center. And I'm not sure if we have that in there. We're continually adding new things to it. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing it real quickly. Um, and I can keep looking, but I don't want to distract from that. So I'll get back to you on that one, Steve. I'm pretty sure it can be any file format, although TIFF is recommended. All right, the next thing that I want to show is really straightforward. I'm already running low on time. I got 10 minutes left, but I don't have quite many questions in the queue. So um, the next thing is let us pray. And this is a nice lead in because um, it is a My Worship resource. So let me show you what let us pray files are like. We will go back to My Worship Resources and we'll go to My Prayers. And these are the prayer of the days. Whoops, actually, I think it shows up under my common elements. There we go. It's used also as a prayer. Yeah, there we go, label prayer of the church. But it is the prayer of the church as compiled by the LCMS Worship Office. And what's really cool about this is that they have one for every Sunday in the church here. And if you use this one, you are using the same prayer of the church that many other congregations are using. So it gives you that kind of walking together feel. So let me show you how you access that. If you go to LutheranServiceBuilder.com, it'll take you to our main site. Down at the very bottom, and it's a little hidden, again, this is most often missed, is a downloads text page. And we put it kind of out of the way, because if you're not using Lutheran Service Builder, it's not helpful. And if you are using Lutheran Service Builder and you find this to be helpful, you can actually subscribe right here, and we'll just send you updates when new ones are added. So you don't need to be going to the website directly. Uh, you can go from the email. But you can see here that we have upcoming services. So I think we are planning on November 11th. We're using the three-year lectionary. So I'll just click three-year, and it'll download a file for me. November 11th, Series B. I'll add that to my desktop. And then I'll go back in here. And actually, I click out of my worship resources so that I can get that settings button up there. And click that settings and import from LSBX file. And when I click on that, it says load this file. I'm going to find that one I just downloaded and open it up. And it's going to say this will import Common Element November 11th, 2018, Series B. So I'll continue with that. Common Element has been imported. I can go into My Worship Resources for My Common Elements. And there's November 11th, 2018. And that's the prayer of the church for this upcoming Sunday. So now when I am planning the service, I'll close out of that. We'll go down to prayer of the church. Oh. Prayer of the church there. I can now search for November 11th. And there it is. And I can just add it into my bulletin. So it's that simple, and it's formatted exactly the same if we were changing our format um, to the pastor's version. It would update all of that accordingly because it's in the LSB format. So that saves a ton of time. First off, you don't have to compile your own prayer of the church or use a different one. You can just bring that in. And what we're looking at doing in the next few weeks, it's in testing right now, um, where you can subscribe to this inside Lutheran Service Builder so you don't have to go and download the file. And you can choose to have it automatically inserted or just give you access to those files. So stay tuned for that. Follow our blog. That's the best way to learn about updates. Um, but we're really excited about that. But that is one that I show in almost every webinar because I think it's so cool and so easy and such a time saver, but it's often missed. All right, the last thing, I've only got a few minutes left, and I apologize. I, like I said, I always go over. The last thing are, is something that we've already been doing, and that is the custom liturgies. So we have been customizing this liturgy with a few different things, such as the communion statement. So let's go back down here. And there is our communion statement that we have. We've already added that to the service. Now, 
I'm going to go over here to document. Right now I'm still using divine service setting one. And I haven't changed divine service setting one for anything but this service. But I actually can do that as my own custom liturgy. So what I can do is I want to say save this. And it'll say my divine service setting one. I can say you know, custom Wednesday, November 7th. And save that. Now, this is going to change this, and you'll see it here. You can over, it's not, uh, it's zoomed in too much there. But if I go up back to my worship resources and my liturgies, this is now going to show up as one of my liturgies. And it's right here. I can always change the name. Sometimes people say DS1, custom November 7th. So you can see in here that this is the outline of the liturgy. And if I scroll all the way down, communion statement is right there. Now I could even go and change this communion statement and say, um, you know, for this one, I'm going to do Matthew, MT, and change all the scripture references to be shorter so that they do all show up. <laughs> and we'll save that. You can even go within this communion state or within this custom liturgy and change part. Whoops, uh, let me go back and change some of the things here. So maybe you don't want to show the sign of the cross in here, or maybe you want to do slightly a slightly different version of the benediction. You can modify this element for that liturgy. Maybe you don't want to do it in the same order here. So maybe you um, want to do the hymn of invocation after the invocation. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it, it might be your preference of the church. You can change this custom liturgy and anyone that can be edited you can also edit that. So like here in this rubric, you can change all of this. Maybe you don't want to tell them why the sign up for the cross may be made. Not a good option, but I'm just showing different ways you can customize this. Um, all of this becomes your own liturgy and you can add or remove elements. You can add custom elements like we did with the communion statement. Maybe you want to, let's go in here and say, add, um, let me go back. You can say insert, and we'll go to common element, and then we'll choose, let's see, usually like the children's message happens right before the Old Testament reading. So we could call that children's message here. And it's just a caption. There's no additional things that go with it. It just says children's message. Um, and maybe you want to add... Let's see. You can always say, well, we don't do the children's message during Advent because there's too much else going on. I don't know. I'm just throwing out ideas there. But just to show you how you can customize your own liturgy to meet the needs of your congregation. So um, that is the last of the five things. And it's kind of a combination of everything we've been doing, um, where we've customized different elements, we've customized the format, we've added things like let us pray, or communion statement. This is kind of the summary of it to say, all right, this is our church's liturgy. And it's not too different from Divine Service 1. It's just a little bit different to meet our needs, um, to meet our the way we do it, or to meet the way we do the bulletin even. It may be the, the service itself looks identical, but what we display in the bulletin, what rubrics are included, is different for our church. So I hope that was helpful to you. I apologize for using just about all of our time on the uh, outline itself, but I do want to thank you for coming and put my contact information on the screen there. You can reach out to me at my email or my phone number. And I also have the software support option there. Um, that is probably the better way to add, ask for specific questions because they usually respond quicker than I do because uh, we've got a whole team of people working on that. But you can reach out to either one of us. And um, if you do have questions, now is a great time to ask them. So I know we have at least one in the queue and we've only got a few minutes left, um, but yeah, Kurt is asking, when will you be doing a webinar on Concordia Organist? 
We don't have anything on the schedule right now, Kurt. Um, Concordia Organist is actually very simple to use. I don't know if I could fill up a whole uh, webinar on how to use Concordia Organist, but I will definitely consider doing some kind of training videos for that because um, it is a fantastic tool. For those of you who are not aware of Concordia Organist, it is a subscription service that we offer that allows you to download high quality recordings of all the music in Lutheran Service Book played to uh, played on an organ. And it was all recorded at the Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne by some fantastic organists. Um, in fact, we've had some people say, you know, I don't want my organist to hear about this because he'll be out of a job pretty soon if he hears how good these hymns are. So I don't think that actually replaces an actual organist. But for those churches that don't have an organist or maybe don't have a backup, it's a, re a really good and affordable solution as opposed to finding and hiring subs for that. So um, keep an eye out for that. Maybe I'll do something on our blog. Um, sometimes I'll do some shorter videos on that. That's good to know that um, some additional help would be helpful to you, Kurt. All right. I don't think I have any other questions in the queue, and I am at time. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll put my contact information on the screen one last time. And thank you for joining us today. I hope you found this information helpful. I uh, hope you found some features or tools within Lutheran Service Builder that you hadn't seen before. And if you do have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out. But with that, I'll say thank you very much. Have a great day.